I never remember a time when I wasn't dancing. I was the live action model for Snow White, and they used me just as a guide for their action. And because none of them had ever been a young girl and knew how a dress would do this or that or the other thing. Most of uh, the animators took the characters, even the animals and the birds, out of themselves. But they couldn't take a young girl out of themselves. They couldn't take the prince out of themselves. Out of nowhere, you know, I got to be in one of the most legendary films and to actually have some kind of impact on it. In the meantime, I had worked on The Blue Fairy and Pinocchio <coughs> and uh, started on Fantasia. The very first picture that I can remember being in was with Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. It gave me a feeling that I would really like to do movies. But what I really wanted to do was go to New York and be in New York shows. And I wasn't tall enough. I mean, nowhere, not even for ballet, was I really tall enough or built for mm -hmm. ballet, and which is what I had really trained for all my life. Your only place, your only refuge place was in musical comedy because there were no standards. Also, you could be funny, you could be a soubrette, you could be a leading lady, uh, you could be a romantic lead, you could do all sorts of things uh, in musical comedy, which, uh, and you could sing. I met him when I was uh, uh, 12, in the ninth grade at uh, Bancroft Junior High. That's when our romance sort of started to begin. There was no thought of teaming up. We just uh, had a good time together. We had so much in common, besides dancing, cats, artichokes. Even though he didn't want to be part of a dance team, he really wanted to be on Broadway without, uh, without having to audition. He hated auditioning. I'd gotten used to it. And uh, so we put together the act at that time, really so that people would come and see us at the Persian Room or somewhere and then think that they had to have us in their New York show. Never worked, <laughs> but uh, we had a good career anyway. I had to cook on the road because there were no places open to eat, not even the hotel. They didn't have all night. Uh, uh, so I, uh, we carried a, a refrigerator that I would stack, uh, it was a little box that I'd stack up with the, the ice cubes from down the hall and uh, we kept uh, whatever we needed cold in that and we also had a one burner hot plate and I learned to cook quite well in the one burner hot plate. We always had uh, lifesavers just off, either off stage or off camera because uh, particularly the peppermint ones seem to slake your thirst. And so, but you never wanted to go on stage with a lifesaver in your mouth because that would be terrible if it came out. So there would be, you know, these uh, uh, ledges. And so by the end of, the <laughs> of any uh, engagement that we had in clubs, there'd be all these lifesavers lined up, a million of them because that, that's what sort of kept you oiled up to, uh, so that you weren't too dry to get through a 45-minute show without drinking. Well, Gower brought the conceptions, and that's his, his strongest point always, was being able to visualize. He also had an extraordinary way of being able to tell a story through dance, I brought a, a con, a, an ability to, to connect with an audience. I love performing. It prepared Gower to become a choreographer director. And that's what the whole act was about. That's why it's Margin Gower champion. And uh, so that people would have the identification of Gower champion as a name. I don't really believe that what I do is choreography. It's too highfalutin a word for a dance director, but the Directors Guild won't let us use dance director anymore. So that's why you have to be this <laughs> choreographer. <laughs> we, very shortly after that, were signed uh, to do uh, the original um, Admiral Broadway Review, 
which was the forerunner of the show of shows. It was all the same team. It was all Sid Caesar, Imogene Coca, uh, Mary McCarty, Max Liebman was the producer. So we were really the first dance team, I think, on television. We hardly even knew what Sid Caesar and uh, Howie Morris were doing until the day of the show. Because we were rehearsing in our own little unit and getting it ready. Mostly we were in a room by ourselves until the day of shooting. And then it was a long rehearsal day because you had to do everything for the camera and uh, be sure that they knew where you were going so that you wouldn't dance off the screen. Then uh, you'd have a day off and then, and then go back, right back into rehearsal the next uh, day after. But everything was live then. When you went on the air, you stayed on the air until you were over. It was really built around Sid and Imogene who had continuing characters, but there were also specialty people. I mean, there were people who did musical numbers or there was the dance team or there was the chorus, and they were really, uh, in a sense, a review with sketches. The basis of what we did were the numbers that we'd accumulated in maybe the last, I would say, uh, we had been in clubs about a year and a half two years, and so we had accumulated a repertoire of, but we, you know, you run out. If you're doing two shows on any one broadcast, so we also had to do new things. And he also worked for the camera. I think that's the, one of the reasons we succeeded on television almost immediately, is that he knew how to put us in position so that we didn't have to be just full figure all the time. Most dancers were we would dance right into so that we would have a moment, two moments, a little scene, a little interchange or something where people could, could see and, and know our faces. And there was almost never a time when we were on television after that that we didn't have close shots and we didn't have some sort of a story going between us so that we had characters. It came about because we had done a couple of uh, shows with Jack Benny. He had his Sunday night show, but he didn't want to work every week. And he felt that if he had another show that he would produce that would go on every other week, then uh, he, uh, he wouldn't have to work so hard. We only did six shows, but uh, it lasted over a period of, well, from beginning to the, uh, to the end of about three months because we rehearsed before. And then we, uh, then we would have two weeks, you know, a week in between each show. In looking at the shows now, I feel that they have a, a kind of reality and a kind of sweetness that very, very few of the shows had. But uh, they, they had the added element of dancing and singing. And we had a wonderful little company there, Buddy Rich, Jack Whiting, who was one of the great song and dance men of the period, and he played my father. And they were sort of situation comedies. I mean, even though you are doing the whole show, you have to learn all the dialogue, the songs, the dances. Put it together. You've got a week to do it in. And I found that very burdensome, especially when I wanted to be home with a new baby. And we did uh, a lot of uh, Ed Sullivan, Perry Como, mm -hmm. Gary Moore. Oh, Dinah was something special. We did the Honey Sisters, Sugar and Spice. I think I was Spice and she was Sugar. And uh, so that, that uh, became a little running thing. Dinah and I liked to do, because we, we could kick up our heels and be a little bit funny. We had done his show many times. In fact, I think we were one of four or five acts who would actually had the entire hour to themselves. It was just the Margin Gower champion show on Ed Sullivan. We did four numbers, three or four numbers on film because we'd been at MGM, and then we did three or four numbers live. And it was, in a sense, our, our whole life story. Ed was one of those that you could always count on for forgetting your name or making it up, making up a new name. He could hardly ever get Marge and Gower out. It was always Marge and Champion or Gower and Marge. And the fact that we had our 
picture on the front of Look magazine, and he held up life. You know, and the, 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 he was all forever doing things like that. And uh, as soon as the show was over, that meant that we were unemployed. We'd been working for, let's say, a week of rehearsal or a week and a half of rehearsal and then do the show. We went to the unemployment and uh, checked in and started getting our unemployment. Well, everybody at that particular unemployment place uh, had seen the show the night before, so we all got a hand as we, as we approached the to register again for our unemployment. The last appearance was in 1960 for Bell Telephone. It was a show that um, Gower directed, also conceived, only eight people. Uh, Louis Jordan, Ginger Rogers, Mike Nichols, Elaine May, Margin Gower, and Danny Costello, who was a, sort of an up-and-coming young singer, and uh, J.P. Morgan. It was all danced. And there, but there were songs and there were dances throughout. It was one complete hour, which still had that live feeling, and one thing blended into another, and those, only those eight people ever appeared, no one else. And it's enchanting. It still holds up. Your body just won't allow you to have the control over it that you have had in the past, and therefore it, it makes you very sh uh, shaky. You, you don't ever lose your sense of, con, of how you could control your body, but it just will not allow it to be controlled the way you want it to be. And that's, that's, a, tough, that's a tough transition. Gwen Verdon said it so beautifully. She said, dancers die twice, when they quit dancing and when they actually do. Most embarrassing moment is losing my dress in front of the Queen of England. The straps broke on my dress, and it, the dress was boned, so I wasn't wearing anything underneath it. He threw it back uh, after they'd had this quick flash, and he made this lovely extemporaneous speech about how much they had enjoyed meeting, because we had been at the reception meeting, Your Highnesses, and dancing for you. Unfortunately, we must part company with you because Marge has part, parted company with her dress. The opening night at the Ambassador Hotel it was like hometown girl, you know, makes good. And it was also because we had both grown up in that town. And uh, the town was Hollywood. I will say, when people say to me, uh, what is your experience in show? How about all those temperamental people you've worked with? I don't, I only remember a couple of times I could count them on one hand when I thought people were behaving badly. So many of the people we worked with, Katie Grayson, Howard Keel, you couldn't work with nicer people. When the uh, nine MGM ladies got together in 1986 to do the Academy Award, and there was everybody from, uh, from Debbie Reynolds to uh, Jane Powell to uh, Esther Williams, Katie Grayson, Ann Miller, Leslie Caron, it was 35 years later and nobody had changed. Debbie was just as raucous as ever and she just came in and was telling everybody what, I mean the same thing as when she was 20 years old. Esther was late for every rehearsal, but it was never her fault. Sid Charisse came in looking so gorgeous you wanted to die of, you know, jealousy. Nothing had changed. We split uh, first in about uh, 1971, and then we got back together again for a brief time, and then by 73, it was no longer possible. It was over 24 and a half years uh, that we were together, but we had also known each other for 15 years before that. So it, and we never stopped being friends. We had a very magical life for at least 22 out of those 24 and a half years. And you can't do much better than that.